Fall, Scheherazade Retold, a tale in the Romance and Medieval Fairy Tale series, written by Demelza Carlton, narrated by Mary Sarah. One. If there was one thing Zoraida hated, it was dragons. Yes, she knew her godson's name was George, and that his only ambition was to slay a dragon like his saintly namesake. But when the youth had chosen the biggest, most irritable dragon ever to crawl out of a cave, she found herself honour-bound as his fairy godmother to volunteer to be the maiden bait for the beast. Bait, yes. Sacrifice, no. But when silly George had gotten himself knocked out by a blow from the beast's tail, she'd had to decide between fighting the dragon herself or losing her godson. Whoever had blessed the boy with intelligence had done a piss-poor job of it. They should have endowed him with some common sense instead. The enchanted sword she'd given him lay on the ground, useless, as he put her blessing to use. Yes, she'd certainly given him all the swiftness a boy could need for running away. Her godson was a fool and a coward, Zoraida fumed. Or perhaps the smoke was coming from her skirt, which was definitely smoldering. Damned fire-breathing nuisance. She lobbed another fireball at the dragon, which splashed harmlessly against his skelly hide, but kept his attention firmly on her and not the fleeing boy. Just a few more seconds and he'd reach the shelter of the city. Then she could leave. The dragon sent a jet of flame in her direction and she was too slow to deflect it. This time her skirt caught fire. Swearing, Zoraida decided George could fend for himself. Thinking to go somewhere that she might smother the flames, Zoraida opened a portal. She glimpsed snow, breathed a sigh of relief and stepped through. Hans eyed his pitiful fire with concern. If he didn't bring more fuel in, the fire would certainly go out, and he'd freeze to death. Hardly a cheerful prospect for any night, let alone Yule. He'd planned to be home by now, sitting before a roaring fire with a mug of mulled mead, stuffed full with whatever his cook had created for the feast. He might not be the richest merchant, but he kept a good cook. So what if his hall was bare of tapestries and he didn't eat from golden plates? Good food needed no gold to satisfy his appetite. What he'd give for a thick chunk of roast pork now, edged with sizzling, crackling, ready to dip in applesauce made from the last of the autumn apples from his own orchards. Instead, he had stale bread and dried fish for supper a gift from the fur traders he'd finally struck a deal with. Spending his Christmas Eve in a lonely trapper's hut in the icy northern wastes was worth it for that deal alone. He'd be the sole supplier of the highest quality bear, a fur much prized among the nobility at home, and a single shipload of the stuff would give him the gold to repair the keep, so that it once again had all its towers like it had in his grandfather's day. But first, he must make it through the night without freezing to death. Good thing he wasn't like some of the men at court, who'd shudder at the very thought of getting their hands dirty. His father had given everything they had, shy of the keep and the land it stood on, to support the Holy Crusade, which had taken his life and left his son to manage the estate. So the new baron had chopped wood, mended fences, worked the fields and collected port duties, all the while learning what he could do, that when his father returned, he could try his hand at the fur trade. News of his father's death had hit him hard, but it had also given him the push he needed to come out here to see if he could deal direct with the fur traders and not the merchants in the northern ports. All that was for naught if he didn't survive the night. And to do that, he needed more wood. Grabbing an axe and an empty half-barrel that smelled of fish, 
he headed outside into the snow. He soon found the woodpile and fell into a rhythm as the exercise warmed his plot. Nights like this he wished he had a wife to share his bed. One day he promised himself, when he was no longer a penniless baron with an empty title and little else. A flash of light caught his eye. He'd seen the aurora dance across the sky many times, but this was different. It was as though a purple window opened up and a blazing ball of fire shot through, flaming like a comet across the sky before extinguishing itself in a snowdrift on the side of the next hill. A shooting star, laughing quietly to himself, he made the obligatory wish, which he hoped one day would come true. Alas, he knew wishes were merely wind. He would be more likely to improve his fortune by retrieving what remained of the fallen star, if anything. Being a practical man, Hans stacked the wood he cut in the half-barrel, then headed up the hill to investigate. He'd never seen a star fall before. Three. The moment that Ida stepped out of the portal, she realized her mistake. No ground met her feet. The snow she'd glimpsed was a hill in the distance and she found herself falling through the air to the ground below. Swearing, she angled her descent as best she could for the hill, which held enough snow to smother her flaming skirts three times over. The snow was deep enough to cushion her fall, too, she found. For when she hit the ground, the impact only drove the breath from her lungs. No broken bones that she could find, fortunately, for she was not particularly skilled at healing spells, and she'd need all her limbs to climb out of the deep pit she created when she landed. Laboriously, she clawed her way up until she emerged into the open air. As the freezing wind knifed through the shredded remains of her dress, Zoraida wished she'd stayed in her hole. Somehow, she'd lost her shoes in her descent, so her bare feet went numb the moment she stepped out onto the snow. Staggering through the drifts, she made it part way down the hill before she lost her footing and tumbled over and over until her head collided with something hard and everything went dark. Four. Hans had seen many things in his life, but when a woman climbed out of the hole the star had fallen into, he found himself rubbing his eyes to make sure he wasn't imagining her. No, he decided, for if he were to imagine a woman on a night as cold as this, he would have wished for one who was warm and welcoming, well wrapped in furs. Not this stumbling, staggering creature in grey rags who tumbled down the hill and lay lifeless at his feet. No, not quite lifeless. She still drew breath though not for long if she was left out here in the cold. Hans hoisted her in his arms, tucking a fold of his cloak around her to keep out the wind. She was surprisingly warm. Perhaps she'd ridden the fallen star from heaven. Laughter rumbled in his throat at such a silly thought. But to Angel and no, the woman needed shelter and the hut was all he could offer her. And at Christmas, all he had he would gladly share. So he settled her on the straw pallet beside the dying fire and covered her with a blanket before wrapping his cloak around himself and heading outside again. He brought in the half barrel of wood, then returned to the wood pile for another load. He might not have much to offer, but he could give her a roaring fire to keep her warm tonight. Hans shouldered the door open stamping the snow from his boots and found himself fixed in the sights of a pair of violet eyes. First dragons, now a bloody bear. If I'd known fairy godmothering was all about battling huge creatures, I never would have agreed to it. Matchmaking must be easier. 
five. To Zoraida's considerable relief, the tall, shaggy figure she'd called a bear chuckled as he removed his furry hood. I'm no bear, lady. I only vow the height of one. I only wish I had two, for you're sorely in need of warmer garments. He nodded at her. Zoraida glanced down. Soot had stained the bodice of her white gown grey and singed the skirt to black-edged ribbons. She must look aside. I fancy a dragon-hide cloak, she said grimly. No dragons here, he said, stacking wood beside a pit of glowing embers fire. Too cold for them, I'd wager. Too cold for us, too, if I don't build up the fire. If you're hungry, I have food on the table. Zoraida wrapped the blanket around herself and rose to investigate. Some dried fish, a pouch of oats, and some salt were all the man had to eat. Yet still he offered it to her. The laws of hospitality were alive and well in this rude hut. She hid a smile. On the morrow, she would conjure a feast to break his fast, which would make any nobleman's mouth water but now she was too tired to summon up a single extra fish. If you get the fire going again, and you have a suitable pot, we could share a fine fish pottage tonight, she hazarded, hoping she can manage to make it without burning anything else tonight. Much like healing, cooking wasn't her forte either. That sounds grand, lady. Zoraida, she corrected, watching him place the kindling over the embers just right so flames licked hungrily at the wood. My name is Zoraida. He inclined his head. Mine's Hans. Well met. He clasped a hand between his huge ones, reminding her that though he wasn't a bear, he was large enough to challenge one for the hide he now wore. Well met, she echoed. Six. Some time later, the woman, Zoraida, Hans reminded himself, announced that their supper was ready. He fetched bowls and spoons, then watched as she filled the bowls with a lumpy mess that she said was fish pottage. It looked like nothing he'd ever eaten before, but perhaps the women made food differently here. I hope you like it, she said. Hans smiled politely and stuck a spoonful of the stuff in his mouth. Alternately hard and chewy, it tasted like she'd burned some of it and put too much salt into the pot. He forced himself to swallow and reach for another spoonful. It's wonderful, he lied. She smiled tentatively and began eating her own portion. Hans watched as her eyes widened, before she struggled to chew and swallow a mouthful there was every bit as bad as his. On the morrow, I'll make something better. I will. More of this? Hans would rather go hungry. No need, dear lady. This would go better with a flagon of aged mead from our cellars, to be sure. But as we are not in my home, perhaps... This is not your home? She interrupted. Hans laughed. Of course not. This is a trapper's hut, to be used by any traveller or hunter who needs shelter for a night. My home is miles from here. There, I wouldn't have to offer you the last of my journey rations. Instead, you would have roast pork, a selection of the finest roast vegetables, mulled wine to warm you from the inside, even if it weren't for the roaring fire. And my cook's yule puddings are worth waiting all year for. You would take me there? To your home? She asked. Hans felt sorry for her. The woman had nothing. He might not be rich by most noblemen's standards, but he had far more than she did. If you wish it, but it is a long journey. We must walk to the next town, where I will procure horses to take us to the port, where we will board a ship to take us to the harbour near my home. She shook her head. The distance does not matter. 
You are offering me the hospitality of your home for a night? Yes. If you can make the journey there, then yes, he replied. Sir Ryder seized his hand. Then we go now. With her free hand, she traced an arch in the air, leaving a trail of light that seemed to ignite when she touched the dirt floor. With more strength than any normal woman should possess, she pulled him through the portal. Seven. From a falling down shack to falling down towers, yet it was an improvement, Zoraida decided. For one, there was no snow in the keep's courtyard, and while darkness had fallen in the frozen northern wastes, here the sun still lingered above the horizon, though not for long. We are home, Hans breathed touching the stone wall as if to reassure himself that it was real. His other hand tightened around hers. Right. Time to make good on that promise. You shall have a true Yule supper. He strode across the courtyard, towing her along behind him. I have returned, he bellowed, and I brought a guest. Doors opened, letting light and people spill out. The Baron is home. He brought a lady. She looks half frozen, poor mite. Fetch that leg of pork, the baron's hungry. Come, my dear, we must find you something to wear. Zoraida blinked, finding her hands held by a kind-looking older woman, whose hair was neatly tucked under a white veil. She was suddenly conscious of her shredded clothes and unbound hair. She swallowed. I would be grateful, Zoraida said. The woman led her inside to a chamber full of chests, with a bed that didn't look like it had been slept in for some time. A trio of younger women crowded in behind her, bearing cloths and jugs of water. Zoraida almost cried in relief. Between the soot and dragon fire, she was badly in need of a wash. The older woman pulled various gowns from the chests, as the girls helped her remove what remained of her dress. Each time, she glanced back at Zoraida, then shook her head, muttering to herself. After perhaps the fourth gown, Zoraida finally caught a few words. The colors are too dark, the woman said. White, Zoraida offered. I usually wear white. It is the mark of a fairy godmother. Fairy godmother, hmm? I thought only royalty got those. The baron's father and mother never told me he had such a thing. And you don't look old enough to have been born on his name day. The woman's eyes seemed to read Zoraida's very soul. I'm not his godmother, Zoraida said swiftly. I'm only the godmother to small children and foolish youths who seek to challenge dragons. They haven't the wit or courage to fight. Hence, she grimaced at the remains of her gown, I think he was some kind of prince. But not all of them are royalty. Some have blood that is destined to become royal. The woman nodded shrewdly. So, not the baron, but his daughter, perhaps. The queen has just given birth to a second prince, and word is that she might not have long to live. If one of the baron's daughters were to marry a prince, Zoraida's heart sank, though she wasn't sure why. Hans has daughters? The woman snorted. No, nor has he found a suitable woman to bear them. He worries so about restoring the castle, so he has a home to provide for his family. Seems to me he'll do all he can to make the home, that he'll forget to find the family. Zoraida relaxed. He is a good man, and a kind one. Any woman would be lucky to be his wife. I do believe you mean that, she passed Zoraida a shift. Put that on while I find you a suitable gown to celebrate Christmas Eve. Tell me, do fairy godmothers take husbands? Sometimes, Zoraida said, pulling the shift over her head. It was made of fine, soft wool. There is magic in our blood, so for there to be magic in the world, we must have daughters. Husbands can be quite helpful for this. The woman laughed. I'll wager they are very helpful. The Baron has no family left. No one. 
It would be a blessing for him to have companionship. Tis Christmas, and I thought... He offered me hospitality for the night, Zoraida reassured her. I shall stay, and true to the season, I will offer him a gift. What he chooses will be up to him, and limited by what she could give. But as long as he didn't ask her to cook, she considered herself quite capable of granting his wish, whatever it might be. Eight. The woman, nay, the lady who entered the great hall, naturally resembled an angel who had tripped and fallen from heaven. Clothed from head to toe in white, she almost seemed to glow in the torchlight. Hans jumped to his feet. Lady Zoraida, he greeted her with a bow. She inclined her head regally. Baron Hans, who is happier to be home than in a hut tonight, I think. He laughed. Indeed, I have you to thank for my swift journey. For that alone, you may stay in my home for as long as you wish. Zoraida blushed and stared at her feet. Hans wondered if Elena had been filling her ears with tales about him while the woman had helped her dress. He opened his mouth to ask. But Elena herself appeared, followed by what seemed like every servant in the keep, bearing food for the feast. For the first time in his life, he was ignored, as every eye seemed to be fixed on Zoraida, including his. Elena had set his place at the head of the table, as was proper, but she set a second place for Zoraida at his right hand, instead of at the table's foot. Someone had already shifted the benches, so that she had a chair to sit on, too. Zoraida assumed her seat with all the grace of a queen, accustomed to wearing such finery as she ascended her throne. It dawned on Hans that she could well be a queen. He'd assumed that because she wore rags, she was his inferior. But now, he swallowed. Lady Zoraida, forgive me, if the fair is not what you are accustomed to, I am but a baron, one of the lowliest nobles in the kingdom, and my household had little notice of my return. So if this meagre feast is not enough, then on the morrow I can... She shook her head. As long as it tastes better than burned fish pottage, I wouldn't even consider turning you into a frog, a fowl or any manner of beast. Eleanor laughed, then smothered the sound with her hand. She evidently knew something Hans did not, he thought. Perhaps Eleanor had not been the only one telling tales tonight. He felt an unfamiliar pang of jealousy. He wanted to hear the ladies' tales. I am grateful, Hans said slowly. What did you turn your last host into? the one who served you bad pottage. Oh, that would be my attempt at supper tonight. I was not taught to cook. I'm also not very good at animal transformations, she said. I'm better at elemental magic. Fireballs. Air currents to slow my descent if I open a portal too high up. I think I made it rain once. Oh, and portals, of course, like the one that brought us here, intrigued, he asked. You mean, you travel like this all the time? Magically? She nodded. It's necessary, what with fairy godmother duties and all. Truthfully, I am an enchantress. But I haven't been one for very long, so I tend to stick to the easy tasks. Blessing babies looking after children when they hit adolescence, at least as much as I am able. I'm told they require less care once they marry, but none of my godchildren are old enough for that yet. George, the eldest, will not reach marriageable age at all if he keeps challenging dragons. Hans wanted to ask a thousand questions, starting with whether she'd actually seen a dragon, 
the servants began serving the meal, and he was soon far too busy filling his plate and then his mouth. His belly reminded him that he hadn't eaten this well in weeks. The pork alone was everything he'd imagined and more. Gentle laughter brought his attention from his plate to his guest. He was a poor host, Hans realised. He swallowed his mouthful of roast pork, then washed it down with some cider. Is the food to your liking? he asked. Yes, of course, she said. I had thought to conjure a feast for you, and thanks for your hospitality, but I see that there is no need now. I would still like to offer a spell in payment for your kindness. If there is anything you want, name it. And if it is within my power to grant it, you shall have it on the morrow. It was Hans's turn to laugh. I am home, sharing a Yule feast with a beautiful, charming enchantress. What more can I wish for? Nine. What more indeed? Hans might well be the first man she'd ever met who was happy with what he had, so Ida decided, as she realized he meant every word of what he'd said. Granted, he was not a poor man by any means, but he was hardly the richest in the land. And yet, he seemed happy, for all his servants said he was lonely. She ate her fill of the rich food, which was quite delicious, despite having different flavours to those she was used to. Just as she was debating whether she could just manage to eat another piece of the sharp white cheese, Hans rose from his feet. I promised the Lady Zoraida some mulled mead. Where is the al wife? Hans demanded. In the kitchens, preparing it, my lord, a man's servant answered. This hall is too drafty when the wind blows from the north. Hans bowed and held out his hand. If you will accompany me, my lady, I believe I promised you a proper yule with mead and mulled wine and the finest puddings you have ever tasted before a roaring fire. Though the thought of more food sounded like madness, she didn't hesitate to give him her hand. Even after a cup or three of wine, the man was still as charming as he had been in the hut. They reached the archway which led to the rest of the keep. But Eleanor blocked their way. She pointed upward. Tis bad luck not to kiss a maiden under the kissing bow, she admonished, wagging her finger. Both of them glanced up. Zoraida saw nothing but a tree branch, wound round with mistletoe. Perhaps this was some unusual northern custom she hadn't yet heard about. Forgive me, Lady Zoraida, Hans said. But my housekeeper is right. I will not let bad luck touch a lady like you. Better to be kissed than cursed. Sir Ida disagreed. She'd never been kissed before. But breaking curses was easy. She just... Oh. His arms wrapped firmly around her, warm and secure, like he wanted to keep her safe. His breath smelled of spices and apple as he gently brought his lips to hers. A chaste kiss, no more. Zoraida breathed a sigh of relief, though he still held her close. Must do a proper job of it, he said. Then his lips were on hers again, more insistent this time, and she gasped at the intensity in his eyes. Not lust, more determination she decided. But all coherent thought fled as his tongue teased hers, lightly at first, becoming bolder as she responded in kind. She wanted to taste him, the tart cider on his tongue and the promise of more, if she wanted it, so much more. When he released her, she nearly swooned. She, an enchantress, to be floored by a simple kiss, Ah, but there was nothing simple about this kiss. There must be some magic in this mistletoe. She was certain of it. Hans caught her before she fell and offered his arm as support. 
I think that will keep you from being cursed now, he said gravely. Shall we? Of course, she replied. For the second time tonight, she felt like she was falling, with no snow to cushion her when she landed, if she landed. For her heart beat so fast, it seemed ready to take flight. Ten. For one terrible moment, Hans thought she would faint. Was this kiss so awful? He'd certainly enjoyed it, and he thought she had too. But now he wasn't sure. Her breathing had quickened as if she feared another kiss. He resolved not to frighten her and offered his arm instead. He sent up a silent prayer of thanks when her fingers wrapped around his forearm. Hans took her upstairs to the solar, the room at the top of the keep. It was bigger than the trapper's hut, but infinitely more cosy. His mother had insisted on piling rugs and cushions on the chairs by the fire so that more than once Hans and his father had fallen asleep while sitting in them. His mother might be gone but her memory lived on in the soft touches she had left behind. Now he was more glad of them than ever, as it meant he could offer Zoraida more comfort than the shack they'd almost had to share. As she took her chosen seat by the fire, once again he was struck by her queenly demeanour, as though this was her kingdom, and she belonged here. His mouth turned dry at the thought of sharing his home, his life, with her, but she was no ordinary woman. She might even outrank the queen, for magic was rare in the world these days, and he'd felt her power coursing through him when they'd kissed. Two, she had accepted his hospitality, and he would honour her properly, with food and drink, and what little entertainment he could offer, stories of his travels, and perhaps, perhaps she would tell him a little of what it meant to be an enchantress, so that for one night he might dream he shared a life with her. Eleven. My skirt caught fire, so I opened a portal, saw snow, and stepped through. And that's how I ended up in the northern wastes on Christmas Eve, with my favorite white gown and tatters, Zoraida finished. She expected more questions from Hans, who had proved to have an almost insatiable curiosity for the most mundane things about her life as a fairy godmother. But the only sound he emitted was a snore. She smothered a giggle. She'd drunk too much mead, she was sure of it but the sweetness and the spices and the sore warming heat of it persuaded her to indulge in a little more than usual. And Hans, the man was such pleasurable company, the way he spoke of his dreams for the future, for his ships, for his home, and for some sort of trade agreement that had made him trek across the northern wastes to where she first encountered him. Could a girl fall in love with a man for his kindness and his dreams? Oh, and his kisses. She would like more of those, but not tonight. She would let him snore in his chair, if that's where he chose to sleep. While she retired to the room, Eleanor had assured her would be prepared for her. As she crossed the courtyard, Zoraida paused to take another look at the crumbling towers Hans had vowed to rebuild. It was Yule, and she'd given him no gift yet. She told him her powers lay in the elements, in fire and air and water and earth. What was stone but the mother of earth, after all? Wrapping her cloak around her, she lifted her arms and cast a new spell. Twelve. 
Hans jerked awake, desperate to find the woman who'd filled his dreams. But he was alone in his solar. Someone had mended the fire while he slept and removed what remained of the jug of mead he'd been drinking last night. But the beautiful lady proved to be nothing but a dream. What had been her name? Something exotic. The lady is a rider. That was it. An enchantress who fought dragons and could travel miles in the blink of an eye, but who couldn't cook the simplest of meals. Hans laughed to himself. He'd even dreamed up an imperfection in the perfect woman to make her seem more real. He should probably head for the hall to break his fast. Smoked fish were what he wanted this morning, with some of that sharp white cheese and fresh bread. He dressed in a fresh tunic and hose, then trotted down the steps to the courtyard. Hans stopped. If he had dreamed the woman, how had he come home? Was his whole trade agreement a dream, too? Losing the lady was one thing, but to find out he was no closer to rebuilding his home than his father had been would be an even lower blow. Hans glanced out the window, feeling his heart break anew at the sight of the ruined South Tower. Except the tower stood tall and whole, right up to the slate tiles on the roof. It was impossible. Hans rubbed his eyes, certain he was still dreaming. But the tower did not disappear. He stumbled down the remaining steps to the barley, where it had been his daily habit to survey the keep before breakfast, vowing anew every morning that he would restore his family's home. Now, on Christmas morn, his vow died on his lips, as he saw the castle as his grandfather must have, its towers rising to the heavens as though nothing had ever toppled them. He felt tears prick at his eyes and closed them. Parents did not weep. Did I do them wrong? A female voice inquired. The sweet voice of a dream. I have never built towers before, but the stone walls seemed to almost shape themselves. They were so eager to be whole again. The walls are sound, but the rooms within are cold and empty. It takes more than shaping stone to make a house a home. His mother had made this house a home. How much he longed for someone to help him do the same. Hans turned, not believing he would see her, for his eyes had played too many tricks on him this morning. Yet there Zoraida stood, wearing a green wool gown today, instead of white, with a smile on her face that lit up the whole world. You're real, he choked out. She nodded. Indeed, I am. If you ever doubt it, remember the fish pottage. Enchantresses do not make good cooks, she eyed the towers. If you wish me to change them or undo the work I have done, simply say so, and I shall. I promised you a wish, a spell. But you would not name your desire, and as gifts are traditionally given at Yule, gifts. A clove orange, a new cloak, a book of hours, not a rebuilt keep. She had given him far more than he could ever repay. I have only one wish, he said, that you stay under my roof for another night and tell me more tales of what you have seen. She began to laugh. But that will only place me even more in your debt for the hospitality. Tomorrow morning... I will ask you to make another wish. Hans took a deep breath. And it will be for another night. And another. And another. Until one morning, I work up the courage to ask for your hand, so that you will stay. Last night was the happiest night of my life. I wish for a lifetime more. Violet eyes stared at him for a long moment. Finally, Zoraida said, Then I shall stay, and when you find that courage you say you lack, 
I want a bower at the top of that tower. She pointed. For I must teach our children somewhere. And your solar is so cosy, I fear they will fall asleep and learn nothing. But at the top of the highest tower, there, they will see the whole world. It took Hans a moment before he could close his mouth. You will? At Zoraida's nod, he continued. Last night, when I saw a shooting star blaze across the sky, I wished I might find a woman, nay, a wife, to grace this keep. I tried to retrieve the fallen star, but you fell at my feet. Now, I find you have done more for this keep in one night than my family have for two generations. How is any of this possible? Zoraida smiled. It is the time of year, I think. The time of mistletoe, magic and kisses. I hope there shall be more kisses. Hans took her in his arms, prepared to provide a lifetime of kisses for the lady of his dreams. This has been Fall, Scheherazade, Retold, a tale in the Romance and Medieval Fairy Tale series, narrated by Mary Sarah. Copyright 2016 by Demelza Carlton, Lost Plot Press, All Rights Reserved. Production Copyright 2020 by Demelza Carlton.